Yeah. Welcome everybody. I'm going to call this regular Board of Education meeting to order. Uh, hey, alguien que necesita interpreta para la junta. There is nobody who, who needs um, translation for meeting. Thank you very much. And I'm going to ask our awesome public information officer. It's always a surprise who I call and everybody knows <laughs> to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, President Good. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hands over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Next, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Ms. Enrique, I move to approve the agenda. Ms. Michelle, uh, second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Next, we have recognitions. PBIS Platinum Recognition, Mount Madonna High School and Elliott Elementary School. Thank you, Mr. Good. Tonight, we are pleased to honor Mount Madonna High School and Elliott Elementary for their recognition by the California PBIS Coalition for their work in implementing evidence-based interventions to support all students both academically and behaviorally. I'd like to ask the two principals to come up here while I say a few things. Diane Padilla and Maricela Rivera. Thank you for being here this evening. Each year, the California PBIS Coalition recognizes schools for the various levels of PBIS implementation ranging from bronze to platinum. In August, staff members at both schools were notified that their school had received a platinum recognition, the highest possible designation by the California PBIS Co Coalition. In case you don't know, PBIS stands for Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. The program is defined as a framework for enhancing the adoption and implementation of a continuum of evidence-based interventions to achieve academically and behaviorally important outcomes for all students. As a framework, the emphasis is on the process or approach rather than a curriculum intervention or practice. The idea of a continuum emphasizes how evidence or research-based behavioral practices are organized within a multi-tiered system of support or what we call MTSS, which is also called re response to intervention. The relationship between academic and social behavior is student success is established and individual student success is emphasized. In short, the Mount Madonna Jaguars and the Elliott Lions are fully implementing tier one, two, and three interventions and there's evidence of its academic impact. I wanna con congratulate our two principals, Mount Madonna principal, Diane Padilla, and Elliott Principal Maricela Rivera on this designation and compliment your staff, your students and families for working so hard within this framework. And we do have two plaques. So I'll just tell you what the plaque says. The Gilroy Unified School District Board of Education proudly recognizes Mount Madonna High School 2020-21 California PBIS Coalition Platinum, Platinum Designee. Congratulations. Thank I can't you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And we have similar wording on the plaque for Elliott Elementary. Congratulations. Thank you. Oh, and we have staff members who have joined us. Con Congratulations, Mount Madonna, Mount Madonna and Elliot staff. We're proud of all of you. Um, great job. Keep up the good work. <laughs> Can you see it? <laughs> oh, my goodness. 
hang on a oh, sec. No, 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 Let no. me get this out of the way. Maybe it's um, is that I'm is that going to work? Smile, everybody. everybody smile. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Now, now you want. Yep. Thank, thank you for coming. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye Thanks for joining us. Next, we have general public comment. I understand we do have some public comment tonight. We do, Trustee Good. We could start with that, please. Good evening, Superintendent Flores, President Good, members of the board. My first two public comments tonight are from Sylvia Bilcher. Dear board members, please reconsider to pose a vaccination mandate on your staff, contractors, and faculty, or our students for the following reasons. Number one, neither the JJ, Moderna, or Pfizer vaccine have proven to protect the individual from spreading the virus, including the Delta variant. That concludes her first public comment. Her next public comment, dear board members, please reconsider to pose a COVID vaccine mandate on your employees, contractors, and students for the following reasons. Neither the Pfizer vaccine nor J&J &J or Moderna have proven to prevent the spreading of the virus or getting infected with it, including the Delta variant. Booster shot after booster shot will have to be enforced as the vaccine is obviously not working. A mandated vaccination will not replace the wearing of masks, six foot safety distance, or COVID tests before coming on campus when someone feels sick, as no vaccination can guarantee that the individual won't get or spread the virus, only that the illness is less serious. The Moderna vaccine is meanwhile on hold in three European countries because of the serious side effects, such as blood clots. Long-term side effects are, not, are currently not foreseeable as none of the vaccines have been tested long enough, but rushed through approval. I am not against vaccines, but I am against mandating a vaccine on my on employees and students. They should be the one to decide whether they want to be vaccinated or not. What happened to the slogan, my body, my choice? Sylvia Bilcher. The next public comment is from Cameron Berry. My name is Cameron Perry, pronounced phonetically, and I'm currently an English teacher at Gilroy High School. I teach five classes of sophomores. I currently have over 130 students on my workload. This year in my class, students are exhibiting more anxiety, anger, tears, and general frustration, and there is an increased need for outside help. My students are lost and confused, and they don't have the resources to meet each other, their individual needs. Thank you for your time. Have a blessed rest of your day. The next public comment. Oh, shoot. Sorry, Mayor. I turned you off. The next public comment is from Sophia Roquet. Good evening, Superintendent Flores, board members, and members of cabinet. My name is Sophia Roque, and I am a first year world history teacher at Gilroy High School. I wanted to comment on behalf of myself and my students. I currently have 36 students in each of my class. To say that I am struggling is an understatement. I cannot be fully present with every student, no matter how much I want to be, because of the caseload and class size. In order to provide more instruction, I would like to see reasonable caseloads and class sizes. If I had less students in each class, I could provide more differentiated instruction and scaffolding opportunities. I could also individualize progress for each student and provide better assistance. With large class sizes, I am struggling to stay on top of every student need, especially ELLs and students with IEPs and 504s. Please consider changing or reducing our class sizes. The next public comment is from David Spindle. It's not fair to force our children into getting an experimental vaccine when we do not know the long-term side effects. The COVID death rate for anyone 18 and under is much less than the common flu. Seeing as the vaccine does not stop someone from getting or transmitting COVID, why are you forcing young children to get it? I have three boys in two schools here. And if there's a mandate, I will be pulling them out of your district in favor of homeschooling. They are six times more likely to suffer from myocarditis from the vaccine than to even be hospitalized from COVID. Please stop this ridiculous mandate. Thank you. The next public comment is from Lauren Mendoza. I am a concerned parent. On Monday, October 18th, I kept all three of my children home from school to protest the COVID-19 vaccine mandate pushed upon the children in the state of California. 
This is my First Amendment right. I called each school to notify them I was keeping my children home for that reason. Yesterday, my ninth grader, straight A student, was notified that she had to attend Saturday school or face suspension. I was notified that although I called to excuse her on that day, it was considered unexcused and therefore had to complete Saturday school. When I asked why my daughter was being retaliated against, I, to I was told it was coming from the state. When I asked why my other two children were not being treated the same, she could not answer. My daughter then let me know that she knows several other students who have unexcused absences and never have had to attend Saturday school. I'm not sure why school is not following I'm not sure why the school is not following their policy if it is the case that one excuse, unexcused absence requires Saturday school, nor why my daughter is being discriminated against for her parents choosing to exercise their First Amendment rights. I am vaccinated and I know that every human deserves a choice as to what is done to their body. My daughter is in honors classes and had several hours of work to make up for missing that one day. I do not want her to attend Saturday school and do not want her suspended, thereby creating several more missed days of school. My daughter is heartbroken at the idea of facing this unreasonable consequence for standing up for the rights of all children and their parents' decision to vaccinate or not. The next public comment is from Lisa Henry. I have been an employee with Gilroy Unified for 15 years and my child attends school in the district. I oppose the vaccine mandates. I have already had COVID and recovered with my natural immune system. If I were to take the vaccine to provide for my family and if I were to have a bad reaction, who is going to care and provide for my children? This is out of your scope and is not a decision you should be making. The next public comment is from Monica Bribariskas. I am an employee of the district. I am also a mother to two and an aunt to children who attend Gilroy Unified School District. I do not attend, I do not agree with the vaccine mandates. As a parent and an employee, these potential mandates have caused stress and anxiety on my family. In the last board meeting, the vaccine mandates were spoken of so lightly without addressing all of the cases where children and adults have suffered blood clots, heart attacks, uncontrollable shaking, neurological, neurological disorders, and even death. Where there is risk, there must be choice. And as a parent who has been informed, I do not want to risk that on myself or my children. Parents are aware the district is looking to mandate this for students by January 1st or July 1st. Children have a 99.9% .9 survival rate. Mandating this would mean I am taking this forcefully in order to put food on the table, not just from my mouth, but my baby's mouths too. Unpaid leave, you say? What happened to laying off employees and allowing them the right and access to unemployment that they pay for out of their own paychecks? As a single mother and as an employee, I ask that you critically think this through. The final submitted public comment is from Adrian Rodriguez. As a parent of a second grader, I am very happy and grateful for the current partnership with Starting Arts that provides music instruction for all GUSD second graders. My second grader comes home from school on the days of the music class, so excited to share what they have learned. I notice a physical, mental, and emotional change as a result of these classes. I urge the board and administration of GUSD to consider music, art, dance, and other enrichments as an investment that provides numerous mental health benefits. Studies have shown music decreases anxiety and depression, improves memory and learning, and reduces stress. I would love to see GUSD offer music to all students and consider mental health services in the form of arts. Please, considering high, please consider hiring music, art, and dance teachers to address the mental health issues our children are experiencing. I have witnessed the positive impact a few weeks of music instructions instruction can have on the life of an elementary student. This concludes submitted public comments. Now, do we have all three people on the line? Okay. Uh, we have two public comments being submitted by members of the public. The first public comment is from Ramona Banuelos. Ms. Banuelos, please provide your comment to the board and please remember to limit your comments to three minutes or less. Thank you. Is she not there? Okay. Ms. Manuelos, if you can hear us, please unmute your mic. Hello. There we go. Hello. We can hear you. Go ahead, please. My name is Ramona Banuelos, and I am an employee of Gilroy Unified, a public servant to the parents and community of this town. As public servants, you and I have a duty to serve the public. You are elected community members to serve as, to serve as Gilroy 
board members by choosing to mandate something that would cause the community distress, you would be doing a disservice to the Gilroy community. Something's happening? What's up? The next public comment is from Valentina. Ms. Valentina, please provide your comment to the board and remember to limit your comments to three minutes or less. Thank you. Ms. Valentina, if you'd like to unmute yourself. Hello. Please go ahead and limit your comments to three minutes. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? My name is Angelica Olguin, not Valentina. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Angelica. Okay. Hi, my name is Angelica Olguin, and as a master's level therapist who understands the importance of research and data to support the findings, we found it disturbing and concerning that in the previous meeting, there were many statements made regarding mandates that were not supported by facts. The statements were dehumanizing, belittling, unwarranted, and derogatory. I strongly oppose the unconstitutional injection mandate. The last meeting touched on mental health support. Seven elementary schools in the district, one includes a therapeutic program for students in special ed with emotional disturbance. Short staffed with one teacher for grades kinder through fifth, when we typically have two teachers. The program is supported by paraprofessionals and a mental health therapist trained to work with this population. In the elementary therapeutic program, mandates would place half of the staff in this program on unpaid leave, myself included. When Dr. Flores mentioned potential impact on staffing and on special ed, Trustee Good, you said, it's all critical, but if you have dead kids or dead employees, it's not really going to help them. You make false statements that harm staff's professional reputation, show a reckless disregard, causing staff emotional distress. This is defamation of character. You make statements with conviction, yet no cases to back it up. Those that are vaccinated can get it and spread it. Should everyone be testing? According to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, data collected as of 8 2021, there have been 623,341 total reports of adverse reactions from the COVID 19 vaccine. This includes 17,794 permanently disabled, 6,071 heart attacks, 5,093 myocarditis, 4,785 Bell's palsy, 5,721 anaphylaxis. And as of recently, I reported more than 17 deaths, 17,000 deaths, excuse me. Dusty Nelson, you said, quote, I don't want to wait until July 2022. I want to travel again. The 10% of GUSD staff have no impact on your travels. You said, I'm in the opinion there is enough data to support the efficacy and safety of the vaccine. Keyword opinion. You referenced the measles outbreak. According to the CDC, research for the measles began in 1954. The first measles vaccine came out nine years after the start of the research. Five years after that, a better version was created. A total of 14 years from the start of the research. We can't compare a vaccine that took 14 years to one that uh, took to one that took just a few months. Dr. Rubin of the FDA on his guest vote said, quote, we're never going to learn about how safe the COVID vaccine is unless we start giving it. That's just the way it goes. That's how we found out of rare complications of other vaccines, end quote. Trustee Nelson, you said you're willing to take some heat and mandate it for the staff now. Are you willing to take some heat of being held liable should staff experience adverse reactions? Thank you. This concludes public comment. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I will call report of action taken in closed session. And we have a number of expulsion cases. First, I'll call case number 2022-05 and ask if we have a motion. Ms. Enrique, I move to expel. This is James. I will second. I have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Is there a second motion on this case? This is Linda. I move to suspend the expulsion. Ms. Enrique, I second that. All right, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Next, I will call case number 2022-06 and ask for a motion. Does Michelle move to expel? This is Linda, I second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Next, I will call case number 2022-08. Is Enrique, I move to expel. Ms. Michelle, second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 
Thank you. Uh, and I would ask if there are any other further motions on this case. Move to suspend the expulsion. I second that. A motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Next, I will call case number 2022-09. This is Linda. I move to expel. This is Enrique. I second. So a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And I'll ask if there's another motion on this case number. This is Enrique. I move to suspend that previous expulsion. Same. Uh, sorry, second. All right, we have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Lastly, we have case number 2022-11. And I would ask if we have someone who wants to make a motion to approve the agreement for a stipulated suspended expulsion. This is Linda. I so move. This is Enrique. I second. We have a motion to second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Next, I'll move on to item number 2E, Conference with Legal Counsel, Existing Litigation. OAH case number 2021-100-375. The board approved a settlement agreement to resolve a student's educational claims. The motion passed 7-0 with trustees Aguirre, Diaz, Fiac, Good, Nelson, Pace, and Piscino voting yes. And that concludes the reportable action in closed session. Next, I would ask our student board representative for report, Josh Barnson from Gary High School. Josh. Good Good evening, good evening, everybody. My name is Joshua Barnson. I'm the school board representative for Gira High School. And this is the El Roble and Gira High School presentation. So we're gonna be starting off with the uh, El Roble Elementary School. Um, they started off the year by welcoming their students back, uh, making sure that they're following all of the safety protocols that they're able to. Uh, no, it's not advancing over there. We have it right here, but it's. it's so they welcome back their students back to school, uh, making sure they're following all the safety protocols. Um, And then let's Um, the El Roble hosted a trunk retreat for the families of the school, along with a pumpkin carving contest, and had cute photo ops for all of the students and their families. Um, they had a character development and social emotional lessons, uh, which included Socratic seminars to create discussions and debates on class lessons with the school counselors to engage in conversations with students about social emotional awareness. The fourth graders held an outdoor puppet show um, with the audiences from the other grades that were invited to watch their performance. And this is Mighty, their school mascot that has been introduced. Uh, this is him uh, visiting the crowd at the trunk retreat. Uh, now we're moving on to Gilroy High School. As always, we upheld our tradition of senior parking spot painting on September 11th and 12th, where all the seniors are, can express their creativity through the painting of their parking spots. Um, we had our meeting with one of the students, uh, one of our students and three of the Takamachi students uh, for the sister cities. Um, so three of the Takamachi students from their high school and they talked about their everyday lives and how the pandemic has been treating them. On September 17th, we held our ASB and class officer elections during lunchtime. 
On the evening of October 6th, we held our senior parent meeting where our academic coordinators met with students to talk about graduation requirements and senior activities. During lunch on October 8th, we uh, held our club rush where clubs advertise themselves through the sales of goods to other students and staff. Um, on that same day as club rush, we had our pink out at school uh, and at the football game that evening to, to spread breast cancer awareness. We're currently holding our canned food drive, uh, which started on October 11th and is going to be ending on November 12th. We held our choir concerts on October 13th and 14th uh, with our three primary choirs, um, along with the Solar Sauna Choir that attended. Then from October 18th through the 23rd, we held our Homecoming Spirit Week, uh, where we started with Mix It Up Monday, where you would swap places with one of your friends. Uh, Twilight Tuesday, uh, where it was a blackout day, everybody wearing black. Werewolf Wednesday, where the students would wear flannels to school. Thriller Thursday, where you were allowed to wear your Halloween costume to school. Uh, and then Spirited Friday, where we would wear blue and white. Um, as always, we held our parade float building after school uh, from October 18th through October 22nd, with all the overall themes being monsters. The freshmen chose witches and warlocks. The sophomores chose vampires. The juniors chose zombies, and the seniors chose ghosts. Uh, and then on uh, the Friday, the 22nd of October, we held our homecoming rally with Marty the Mustang hyping up the crowd and getting photos. And as always, we held our tradition of tug of war at the very end of the rally. We held our annual homecoming parade on the 22nd of October. Uh, and as always, we had football, cheer, and the class floats as a center of attention. And I'd like to thank Dr. Flores for being in the parade with us. We had our homecoming halftime show that same night with the uh, dance class performing, our traditional cheer routine, a marching band performance, and our annual fireworks show. Afterwards, we crowned the homecoming king and queen, along with handing flowers to each of the homecoming princesses. We held our annual homecoming event with arcade games, mini golf, Connect Four, and many other activities. Um, and then we had students and staff uh, help make sure the activities were run smoothly. And we decided against music to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And then we had food for anybody who wanted and a photo booth for anybody uh, if they'd like to use it. Then as always, we are holding our annual Treats for Troops, which is a um, yearly thing we do to make sure that the troops overseas are able to get candy uh, from Halloween um, from our students, making sure there's no chocolate. And they also get letters from uh, ASB. Um, we have our winter sports that just started uh, on Monday, November 1st. And then we recently held several senior nights, including volleyball, volleyball, water polo, field hockey, tennis, and cross country. Our cheer, football, and marching band senior nights are currently postponed due to COVID. And then we have our upcoming events, which are uh, Veterans Day on November 11th, our week of thanks from November 15th through the 19th, and then um, Thanksgiving vacation begins November 21st and goes through the 27th. Uh, that's it for the Yarrow High School presentation. Uh, do you have any questions, comments, or concerns? Thank you, Josh. Despite the technical difficulties, it weren't your fault. You did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have superintendent's report, Dr. Flores. Thank you. Good job, Josh. Um, I've had a really busy couple of weeks since our last board meeting. The following morning after our board meeting, I attended the South County Annex ribbon cutting ceremony. As you all know, of course, when we closed ADB, we decided to um, have a joint use agreement with uh, the Sa Santa Clara County Office of Education. And they have since been using the annex, but during uh, the shutdown, it was minimally used. So now it's up and running with quite a few programs and offices located in the building and that's why they had the ribbon cutting uh, this month. Of course, we had our facility subcommittee meeting uh, like we do every month. I, and our IT committee has been meeting every other Friday, as was already mentioned. And I believe I have a perfect record. I attended the homecoming parade. I haven't missed one since I got here. And I always love it. It's a fun event and it's great riding around with everyone else in the parade. Um, on October 20, October 26, the booster shot became available, and 
as you can see from the screen, there's a lot of information about that. You can find it on our website also. On the 27th of October, we started formal negotiations with GTA. So that was our first day, October 27th. Last Thursday, uh, Twin Fayak and I were able to attend the South County, the Santa Clara County Office of Ed Teacher of the Year celebration. And I was so proud of our staff because we had five teachers in total being recognized. Anna Benich, of course, is our Teacher of the Year. It was a very special occasion and um, in person again at a new venue, which I personally thought the new venue was much better. And uh, we, the three of us, um, Mark Good, Linda Pacino, and I have a monthly meeting with this uh, mayor and city administrator. And those are always very productive meetings because we share uh, interest and concerns with each other. And we've been able to do a lot of things over the years through those meetings. And then on October 29th, um, for the first time in two years, we had a district office potluck. It was outside, by the way, um, to be safe because of COVID. But we used to do quarterly pot potlucks before we were shut down and usually around various holidays or themes like Halloween. So this year, um, each department had their own theme, believe it or not, that's GRU and the Minions. I'm GRU and the Minions. <laughs> um, and there were lots of other uh, student services. I forgot what the theme was, but they're walking around in these very cute uh, ballerina outfits. But anyway, it was a lot of fun. It was Care Bears, Care Bears. Care Bears. What was Ed Services? Yes, deck cards. Anyway, everybody got very creative. I would say it was a huge success and just great to be able to have an event again with all of us in person, wearing masks indoors and outdoors. Um, most of the people were even wearing them outdoors. We hosted um, Tuesday, was that Tuesday? God, all right. Um, uh, we deci I decided to try uh, hosting with the public health department a clinic just for GUSD staff. And I'm really proud that 137 people came to the clinic and uh, got either a booster or a first or second shot. And we may do it again. Nobody over there wants me to say that. But anyway, <laughs> it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. And um, this morning, I attended a meeting um, led by Mark Turner, CEO of the chamber. Before we shut down, the chamber was leading a community vision visioning process. And I was really appreciative that they had decided to include the district in that process, me in particular, but cabinet contributed to our part of the uh, community vision document. And uh, you know, then we closed down literally a week before they were going to distribute this document. So, um, but the good news, what came out of that is uh, we've decided as a group, and these are all leaders in our community representing different parts of our community that we're gonna meet at least a couple of times a year, maybe more to talk about the document. It really just gets the discussion going. And we acknowledge today that because of the pandemic, we need to make some modifications to the document. And so we're gonna continue to meet and talk about that. I wanted to highlight um, our two first APS visits at Brownell and Elliott. We're doing them a little bit differently this year, relying heavily on, on input from the site about what they want us to focus on during the visit. So we did Brownell on Tuesday and Elliott today, and it both went really well. And I know, I, I think I speak for all of us that participated that we're really impressed with where they are as far as uh, the focus areas and the efforts made by staff and by the principal, it really is great to see them addressing so many things in their programs in the classroom. And I have to highlight today at Elliott that I could have spent an hour with the new music teacher. It was the best elementary music lesson I've ever seen in my career. All of us were just like grinning, couldn't see us, but we were grinning. He is the most talented and engaging music teacher I've ever seen. 
And so we're very excited. As you know, we've had trouble recruiting. This is through Starting Arts, and he is a local musician. He lives in Gilroy, so it's really great. And he is providing through the Connell Grant music to all second graders in the district, because that's the grade level the Connells wanted us to focus on. And I can tell you, watching those children, it's going to be so successful over the course of the year. So it's really great. Oh, you would ask. Aaron Nicholson. He's obviously very, a very talented musician just on his own. But the way he was engaging the students, they were dancing, they were singing, and he was teaching them about uh, instruments from the orchestra and having them pretend they were playing instruments. It was just such an engaging, great lesson. We have uh, three upcoming visits, South Valley, El Roble, Solar Sano. And I wanted to highlight that um, Sonia Flores is in Washington, D.C. with Anna Benich, Teacher of the Year, um, for the National Blue Ribbon Ceremony in the morning. And it is live stream. We sent it to all of you, and we're, I'm planning to watch it. I wouldn't miss it. And um, also, Sonia Flores, as we talked about last time, is one of eight principals in the whole in the United States being recognized as an outstanding <clears throat> school leader. And it's called, the, sorry, the Terrell H. Bell Award for Outstanding School Leadership. So we're very proud of Gekka and of Sonia. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Flores. Next, I would call the consent agenda and entertain a motion for that. This is Linda, move approval. Ms. Michelle, second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Motion carries. Next, I'll call action item number 7A, Gilroy Unified School District Professional Development Report. This is an information item. Good evening, President Good, trustees, Superintendent Flores, thank you for allowing us to present to you this evening. We will be presenting on our GUSD professional development plan. It's not, Maribel, it's, it has to be this? Okay. Sorry. Let's see. Okay, normally it's Mr. Mesa, tonight it's me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we focus our professional development goals mainly around to the learning of all students. Um, but learning of students um, is many different aspects. So we focus not only on the curriculum and the academic needs of the students, but also social and emotional, on the culture and the climate, um, technology and resources, and really capacity building within our teachers. Because we know the better prepared our teachers are, um, the better of an education our students will receive. So what guides our professional development, really first and foremost is data. So we use our students' academic data. We've also used Healthy Kids Survey data. Um, and we also use um, formative data that we receive from the schools to determine our strengths and our weaknesses within our system. We also are mandated by state, or state and federal requirements related to funding sources on professional development and what we will be offering to our teachers, which includes specific laws and policies, which we are receiving some more mandates as of this year, and certain areas that we must cover with our staff. We also receive input and feedback from our stakeholders. We take surveys after every professional development to see what went well and where we need to improve. We also, as part of the LCAP process, discuss the needs and the professional de development needs of all of our different associations within the district. Um, we also ask for an external program evaluation. So that is through LCAP and through our county office where they give us feedback and input as to 
to what we may need to do. For example, right now we are still in differentiated assistance through the county um, because of our areas back in 2018-19. It's been a while, but we haven't had new data, so we are in differentiated assistance because of that. So they also will give us certain areas that we must focus on for professional development. And then we will focus on staff development standards and what research says is the best practice for providing um, professional development to our staff. <laughs> it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there we are. Okay. Um, so as Deb mentioned, we do have federal uh, funding sources and as a component and, an, and a condition of receiving those federal funding sources, we are required to provide professional development. And those center primarily around meeting the needs of certain student populations. For example, Title I, um, those are Title I eligible students or with Title III, those are mostly around English learner support. So we uh, must include and use the funding um, components of the funding towards professional development. And as you have heard through the last years about our different district or plans, uh, we have in each of those plans a professional development component. Again, that is identified by the state as one of the priorities, and we are required to respond to that. For LCAP, as Deb mentioned, uh, we do use the data that's uh, provided to us in terms of pri previously our dashboard data, which would identify um, some key areas that we need to address in terms of student performance and the subsequently how we um, prepare our teachers to better address the needs of the students. Um, coming soon, next board meeting, you will hear about a new grant called the Educator Effectiveness Block Grant that is specifically designed to provide a funding for professional learning for paraeducators, classified staff, teachers, and administrators. So we will pre be presenting a draft to you next board meeting. We just got the um, information on that plan this last month and laws and policies. Um, as we update board policies based on new ed code regulations, then those again include professional development. For example, McKinney-Vento students, uh, we are required, or anything that is a, re a suicide prevention is another area that we are required to provide professional development. So to emotional learning, equity and diversity, uh, the needs of um, meeting the needs again of diverse student populations. So all of these things uh, impact the uh, professional development that we provide in the district. And uh, we also take into account the National Staff Development Council standards for staff development. These are the big three areas that you need to consider when planning and implementing pro uh, uh, professional development context, process, and content. And all of those things make for a more impactful uh, learning opportunity for the participants. So when we um, think about the professional development follow-up, I don't know why that T is. Sorry, it <laughs> it's not that way in ours. <laughs> um, continuous improvement obviously drives what we're trying to do. Uh, and again, looking at the data, determining what our next steps are. Uh, we look at classroom practices and being able to support staff in implementing whatever professional learning that they are involved in. What does it look like in the classroom? How do we support and encourage? And, and what are the expectations around those, um, of those uh, implementation? Um, and measuring the impact. And when we say impact, it's not just on student learning, but it could be on school collaboration, collaborate um, at school culture. Um, it could be on family involvement. So there's a lot of different ways to measure the impact of professional development and the feedback loop again, where we collect data from the participants and we look at, you know, what are the things that um, are being well received and also uh, what uh, people are asking for continued support with. At the elementary level, the model is um, a multi-year approach. 
we as elementary teachers, as you know, are responsible for all content areas. And so it's a little bit different. Or there's always a curricular focus um, in our professional development. And that is aligned often with maybe our adoption cycles. So for example, we recently adopted science curriculum. So therefore we rolled out professional development for all teachers around science. Uh, so it is also designed to reinforce key areas, literacy, language development are some of our key areas, and you will see that in every year, um, the uh, professional development opportunities. Professional development takes many forms. Uh, staff development days, as you know, you uh, see you get information about our staff development uh, days, our LCAP goals that are focused, mandated trainings that all staff participate in, job alike trainings um, that uh, student uh, par uh, staff members can participate in. And at the site level, it's very much centered around the school plan goals, which are, of course are in alignment with the LCAP. They could include all staff, or we could have some grade level teams, or even cross grade level teams, or even cross school teams that are working on some professional development focus areas, or it could be one on one coaching. We also offer after school and summer uh, uh, volunteer paid opportunities, and there are lots of choices for those. That could be an individual, or could be teams, or could be a whole school that participates in that. And then um, not on this slide, but also I think very important is colleague to colleague because we know that uh, professional learning often occurs when to, when co colleagues work together and they learn from one another. So the model is a in elementary is a graduated model. We always have a mandatory session or, or one or more mandatory sessions, usually at the beginning of the school year. As I mentioned, it is centered around some of the key initiatives. So this school year, for example, second step curriculum was new. And so second step was a part of our first staff development day for all staff in in the September one. So there is always a mandatory session around key areas. We have usually GLAD and SEAL, a literacy component, a curricular component. And then we offer some choice sessions. And uh, those are an array of different um, topics. Try to have those topics so we can look at uh, topics that are maybe specific to early elementary and others that might span the whole group. For example, this next professional development, we're doing one on emerging literacy for our TK teachers because they specifically have some unique needs and they identified for us some sources that they would like to see and we we are um, going to give them that, that training. Um, but also big, big areas across actually K-12, you'll see these like e equity and engagement um, and social emotional learning and small group instruction. So this is an example, this was back in 2019, but you'll see that it's an example where there's a mandatory session and then there are choice sessions. And this one was a recent, uh, this was our November, uh, October, October, October. <laughs> October professional development. We tried something new this time and actually it was well received. It's a little bit cut up on this slide, but after um, their glad, we did seal or glad for every teacher based on our cohorts. As you know, we are um, involved in seal and glad training for every teacher, el elementary teacher in the district. And so we run through a variety of cohorts. We have um, schools such as Elliott and Glenview and uh, what was ADB, but El Roble, um, they all and Rucker were our original seal schools, but we continue to support those teachers in refinement and they're way past unit development. They're just, it's a, a regular part of instruction as we saw in our, in our visits, it's a regular part of instruction, but they continue to work together. So in this case, every teacher was involved in some component of SEAL or GLAD, whether it was refresher or whether it was an introduction. But then on the second uh, session, we offered what we called application phase. This is something that teachers have asked us. They'd say, you know, we learned something, but we never really get a chance to process it and talk about it together. And so um, they liked this a lot. Um, they basically took what they learned and then they um, worked together in their cohorts. They did ask that next time they go to cross school cohorts, so that's something we'll look at as well. Um, so this was just a different, a different way to look at it. And again, site-based uh, takes on a lot of different uh, um, um, 
uh, focus areas. We have some schools that are very involved in PBIS training and others that are, um, you know, they've done all of that training. Whole brain teaching is uh, in a number of schools. Thinking math is something that we provided over the years, and we have some trainer of trainers amongst our teachers, which is really exciting that they now are passing along the learning to others. And of course, a professional learning communities is all our schools K-12, that is a very important part of our professional development. And there are some examples of our after school professional development. And as you know, we're trying out these new courses like the letters course, which is being very well received today. Right now they're having their first debrief session, but it's going very well. And I think the teachers appreciate, um, although it's a lot of work on their own learning, um, uh, they're actually finding it very valuable. And it is helpful that we are compensating them for their time. We know it's a lot of, um, a lot of their efforts. And I did want, before passing on to my colleague, I wanted to acknowledge that we, we work really uh, well collaboratively with student services when we're designing our professional development. It's something we work, um, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we can span the needs of all the participants and all of our different types of teachers. And then, you know, with paraeducators and paraprofessionals, Leanne Gasciola helps us out with that as well. Um, and in our department, uh, you know, I have to acknowledge Kanani Pratt and Kay and lots of different people who come together to make sure that professional development is well coordinated and uh, runs smoothly. So I just wanted to point that one out. Thank you. For the secondary professional development, we have a slightly different model and we consider it a differentiated approach. We really look at the 10 characteristics of professional learning. And the biggest one that is the most difficult for secondary is that it's applicable to the people because we are so diverse at secondary with so many specialties. It is almost impossible to have one professional development um, that will meet all of their needs. So, um, a couple years back, I don't remember the exact year, uh, we had a lot of feedback that especially for our teachers that are in singleton areas, or they only, they're the only teacher of one particular course, that really what we were offering to them didn't apply and they wanted something different. So we went to this new differentiated model to allow for more choice for those teachers as well as to the rest of our secondary staff. So with our, the overview, we do have our staff development days that just like with our elementary, they're focused on our LCAP goals. And with that, we do have one day that is mandatory. That was an agreement between the union as well as the district. The union actually wanted one day to be mandatory in August when we come back so that they have the opportunity to see all of their colleagues. Now, in Zoom, that has been more of a challenge, but really the goal is, is that um, they have one day where they're actually there on one campus with all of their colleagues. The other two days are optional um, if they choose a personal pathway. Um, we do have mandatory sessions, however, whenever we have textbook adoptions or if there are other needs that are mandatory. Um, those staff members are told in advance that these sessions are mandatory and they would not be allowed to do a, a personal pathway in that case. We also, um, just like elementary, have our site-based PD, and those are based on their SIPSA goals and what they need specifically for their school, because each site is at a different place and has a slightly different goal, although all of the goals are based on improving our students' um, academics, um, focusing on their social-emotional wellness, um, and creating a positive culture. Within that, there are different stages, and so the professional development looks a little bit different. And then again, the personal pathway is choice opportunities for our staff. So for the mandatory sessions, very similar to the elementary, we focus on the curriculum. This year we had mandatory sessions on our view boards, which are our new um, boards within our secondary classroom so that all teachers would receive the training on that to be able to use them effectively. Um, we also have mandatory trainings and we have um, what we call our minimum days for curriculum development where those days are often focused on English language learners and those strategies, as well as focusing on how to meet the needs of our students um, with an IEP. So choice sessions are 
very diverse. So um, we have um, a long list. We actually have an entire website um, that shows different options that they can choose from um, with many opportunities in our social emotional learning, equity, PBIS, um, student engagement, as well as technology. And there are a lot of options for our teachers to choose from. With the site-based professional development, we have been doing a lot with our social-emotional supports, um, trauma-informed care, behavior and intervention, student in engagement. A lot of that has also been done through our PLCs because part of the PLC work is cycle of inquiry. So as they're looking at the data they have, part of that is asking the questions why. So why is the data what it is? And they have to dig a little bit deeper. And through that, they also realize certain areas where they need more support and more professional development. We also, at the secondary level, have instructional specialists in different areas, um, EL, science, and tech. And really what their focus is, they are based at the sites, and their goal is to really support teachers within the classroom um, with the needs that they have for those particular learners. They often focus on um, our um, newer teachers who are just really learning about how to differentiate what the students need, how to um, incorporate different strategies into their classroom. Um, this year, however, and honestly, thanks to the shutdown, our, um, our specialists have gotten very good with technology as well. And many of them have their own sites or Google Classrooms um, where they are putting up information on a regular basis that all of their staff can access. Um, and, Mr. Smith at Christopher High right now is my idol with creating um, Google Classrooms on our new view boards and all of the new tools that you can do with them. He posts something almost every day for his teachers on what he has learned about those. So with the personal pathways, they can take a personal pathway in many different areas. It can be in a curricular area. It can be in technology. It can be... Um, really on social emotional learning. We have PBIS, we have restorative justice, we have AP conferences over the summer. We have English learner um, seminars as well as um, classroom management um, that they can do. Um, what they do in order to do a personal pathway is they must first present their plan to their principal and have it approved by the principal because it does in fact have to still match our SIPSA as well as our L L L ah, I can talk LCAP goals. Um, and also then it will be submitted to Ed Services where we review to make sure in fact that the professional development that they are requesting has been vetted. Uh, so we have been building this site over the past couple of years with the help of our staff who have given us ideas for not only our teachers, but also our paraprofessionals on different um, organizations that they have found that provide quality staff development within their field. Um, and we ask them to do that because I am not an expert in every subject area and they can better tell me what will help them and assist them within their classroom. So with our input and planning, um, student services and ed services sits down with GTA, with our GFP and CSCA. Um, Leanne Gaxiola assists us quite a bit with this as well to determine um, what, what works for them and what they would like to see, what has been working, what will work. Um, for GTA, our contract um, does have an annual review where we discuss our format for um, professional development. And we talk about, for example, the personal pathways and that requirement that one day is um, currently mandatory. Those are the types of things that we review at those meetings. So that is a brief overview of our professional development. I do know we send you um, the options that we have for elementary and secondary before each one of our trainings. I also want to mention that not only do we have these, we also, as you know, have the mandated trainings that Dr. Winslow and his office helps us roll out to all of our staff as well that are requirements that normally must be done before October 1st. So we have those trainings as well. So that's the end of our presentation. Any questions? Thank you. Are there any questions or comments? This is Michelle. I have two questions. Trustee Nelson? I think it's two. 
is there a possibility of more differentiation for elementary? So, for example, a teacher has had training in SEAL or GLAD year one, year two, year three. Is there something else that, that – is that an option down the road? Um, so, yes, uh, absolutely. You know, one of our challenges, as I mentioned, is a teacher in elementary is responsible for all subject areas. And we, uh, you know, for consistency of practice, it's really important that we, that everyone receives the same types of foundation. But we do have teachers who are, you know, maybe further along in an area, which is why we try to offer those choice sessions. Um, honestly, we have a few trainer of trainer teachers who are willing. We have a lot of excellent teachers. And I would love for those teachers to provide some support to their colleagues. And we have a few that are willing to do that, but many people are not as comfortable presenting to their peers. But that is something that we're working on because um, they have a lot to share, um, particularly with you know teachers who may not have that uh, particular scale, skill area. So again, the differentiation is uh, you'll see in the upcoming January, we have about nine different sessions to choose from um, on their choice sessions. So, but again, some of them are appropriate for, you know, if a person, we have a depth and complexity training, we have someone on technology, we have, you know, all different kinds of choices. So a person could choose that. But half the day is pretty much set for everybody. Um, the, in the January one, the first session is set and the remaining two are choice. So that's, uh, so that's, you know, um, so three hours, four hours, four and a half, four, yeah, four and a half hours in the morning. Yeah. That's mm. the four. No, two, no. The second that's session it. is between 10 o'clock and 12 and the third session is between one and two forty five. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there a possibility that elementary teachers can take advantage of the personal pathway that secondary teachers can use? So um, I think that, that that's definitely something we could take a look at. Um, as again, I, I, it's, a, it's a different model um, and we would be, we would need to sit down and kind of talk about how that would, what that would look like. Um, there's a lot of excellent training out there. And I think that one of the things we're moving towards, like in our summer, we'll be talking about this next week, are some institutes where teachers could go deeper in depth. So we could look at maybe some in lieu or we get, you know, um, most of these will be offered for pay. So, if, you know, if we looked at it in lieu, you can't do both. You could choose one or the other. So, um, yeah, I think there, it, it, it is a possibility it's a, it's a little bit more challenging, as I say, because we're usually doing a curricular cycle um, every few years. So, but it's not, it's not, it's a, it's a great thing for us to explore. Okay, I just want to leave that possibility. Oh, definitely. Open. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any other board questions or comments? Trustee Diaz. Uh, thank you for your presentation. So one of the ideas I had that's not in professional development space, but it actually opens up space for professional development to be absorbed is kind of something that uh, would benefit the employees at home or in, their, or in their personal time. And so some ideas that I have, I've mentioned them before in terms of uh, financial wellness, but even personal wellness, something that, that allows that extra space to not be worried either either working sessions, and I understand that it's for pay, so maybe it could be like a working session over lunch where they're done at that point, but uh, ideas are what is a 403B, what is a 457, stuff that's actually offered through the district, but they may not know about them or how to go about opening them. I've heard that it's kind of difficult to open some of those things. Uh, life insurance, especially this past year where issues of life have really come into play and and if people are making choices between uh, vaccination or not, maybe they can have other things in play that can kind of mitigate those choices as well. Uh, they're caring for elders, they tend to be, we tend to be in a sandwich generation. So those are totally brainstorming at this point, uh, but ideas that would allow that, that great information and, and sessions that you have to be absorbed. So ideas. 
And we do offer some of those through our human resources department already um, for as voluntary sessions for staff to come to. So those are already incorporated. We also um, in our sessions um, do have through our social emotional learning specific um, sessions um, for educators on their own personal wellness um, so that they are healthy and both mentally and physically to address their students. So we've already incorporated some of those ideas into this model. That's fantastic. Uh, those were some of the call-ins that came in today were, were targeted around that as well. Thanks. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Next, I'll call item 7B, Board Policy 4119.44, vaccination requirement for district employees and other individuals who perform in-person work for the district. Thank you, Mr. Good. I have some very brief comments, and I just want to start by providing just a tiny bit of background information um, and just talking in general terms about this item. But first, before I say anything else, I want to clear up some confusion that seems to exist. This agenda item pertains to a vaccination mandate for staff. This is not an item related to students. This was stated very clearly in the posted agenda and in the attached staff briefing. The board is not considering a mandate for students at this time. We're actually waiting for direction from the state in that regard. And as you know, the governor announced last month that he plans to proceed with a vaccination mandate for all school age children. We do not know when that will go into effect, but that is at the state level that is not something that's being considered this evening. At the last board meeting on October 21st, the board and the staff discussed the possibility of a vaccine mandate for staff. At the end of the discussion, staff was asked to prepare an item for this board meeting so that the board could decide whether to take action or not to implement a vaccine mandate for, for Gilroy Unified staff, and if so, when. In your board packet and posted on our website is a proposed board policy 4119.44 called COVID-19 vaccination requirement. I want to thanks our, thank our legal counsel, Mary Hernandez and Dr. Winslow uh, for working on this. I did it also, I contributed some, but they did the lion's share of the work and they did review a number of board policies from districts in our county that currently have a vaccine mandate. Um, additionally, in the packet, as I'm sure you noticed, is a letter that we're proposing to send if the board approves the mandate and a number of forms. And when I finish shortly, Dr. Winslow will talk about these forms. I do wanna say something uh, new about this policy tonight. Dr. Winslow and I have talked many times about this potential mandate, it feels like daily. And after much reflection, we would like to change, make a change in the proposed policy. If you choose to approve this board policy and a vaccine, vaccine mandate for staff, from an implementation standpoint, we're recommending that the policy go into effect July 1 instead of January 1. So that's our proposed change. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Winslow to talk about some of the forms and exemptions that are allowed in this policy. Thank you, Dr. Flores, members of the board. Um, tonight we are here for your request to present a proposed addition to board policy 4119.44, actually a brand new policy. And as Dr. Flores mentioned, um, based on the board's request, uh, I did engage in some research with our legal counsel on existing mandates within the county. So the product in front of you today is a, a part of that research. It combines some of the elements from uh, the different districts that do have mandates, as well as a full review of the general counsel uh, or our general counsel, our legal counsel. To walk you through the major elements of the board policy, um, you have on the first page really just an establishment of why the board is seeking. Um, or is proposing to seek a vaccine mandate, a requirement of what is actually the vaccine, a verification of receipt, which has actually already gone forth under the state's mandate to verify vaccination status at the moment. Um, and then as well, as I mentioned at the last board meeting, the idea of what are called exemptions, 
as accommodation. So under Title VII uh, federal statute, it does say that mandates um, have to have some type of exemptions as accommodations for medical as well as um, religious held beliefs. So what we've done is we've actually provided the board for review the actual forms that HR would use to engage in the interactive process where we would meet with the employee one-on-one -on -one should, um, should they show interest in an actual exemption as an accommodation, the questions asked and the documents required um, for medical and then specifically the narrative and the questions asked for religious exemptions. We've also provided some of the forms that actually have the solicitation page to request an exemption, as well as the district's determination if it's able to accommodate for that request. And so tonight, uh, we are here to answer any questions on uh, the proposal um, as is or any of the documentation that we've provided. Thank you, Dr. Winslow. Are there any board questions or comments? This or Michelle. CBS? Oh, sorry. Uh, so just taking a step back, I was kind of surprised to see the item on the agenda. Um, I know we discussed it at the last board meeting as an informational item. I, I didn't see clear agreement by everybody to to request information. Uh, I think we all stated some points and they were all great. We all listened to them and took them in. Uh, but I, I certainly, and I was expecting follow-up info kind of thing. I thought maybe you would get a... a something on Sunday report or a weekly report of what could be done, but uh, I was surprised to see it as, a, as an action item. Well, I'm surprised that you're surprised because because the majority of the board indicated they wanted to see it come back it, as an action item. I saw it in almost fact, rest. Fact, I remember saying we appear that there's a consensus, and I think you stated, no, there's not a consensus. I said, well, there's enough interest by a majority of the board. That we're I remember, I mean, I'm looking at the minutes, actually, and the minutes uh, specifically state a member requested information. Uh, and that's kind of what I remember, too, was a member requested information. I, I didn't think it was an action item, uh, but it was, it's a comment. I mean, obviously, it's on the agenda item. Well, we, we heard from a majority of the board to bring this item back for action, and that's what we take our direction for the board, and that's what we did. Are, are there any other board questions or comments? Michelle? Yeah, um, I'm going to take a few minutes if that's okay. <sighs> I did a lot of thinking about this. Um, and at the last board meeting, I made some comments. I felt very strongly about this. And then when it came up, unpaid leave, I said, okay, let me really think about this. Um, just, I would like to say several things tonight. Um, Dr. Forrest already fixed the misperception that this was about student vaccines. It's, it's not, it's about staff. Um, but I do want to say the vaccines are safe and effective. Nothing is 100%, but these are darn close. They do trials. Uh, people who know me know I, I, my career was spent as a science teacher, and you have a controlled experiment, and you have trials, and you test a variable. You try to keep all the other variables the same as much as possible between the control group and the experimental group. And then you look at the data and that's what science is all about. If, if things are leading in a certain direction, you keep going. If the data show that you're on the wrong track, then you change your, your method. But after thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, people participating in trials, the CDC uh, has determined that these are safe and effective in preventing serious illness. Are there breakthrough infections? Of course, my nephew had a breakthrough infection and he was fully vaccinated, but he didn't have to go to the hospital and he's alive. There's also, I think, some confusion between side effects versus real adverse reactions. So I got my booster Tuesday, my arm hurt for a while, big deal. I felt a little bit, something, you know, something yesterday and it was like, I felt it before when I've had a flu shot. Do I want to not get the COVID shot or the flu shot? No, I'm going to continue to do that. Um, if people are really, really concerned about long-term effects, the CDC is continuing to monitor the, the trials. So you can wait a little bit longer. 
uh, Saturday, as I was reading up on this, I pulled up something from the CDC because I thought, okay, how serious are these adverse effects? So I think somebody in the public comments mentioned uh, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, VAERS. So <clears throat> the CDC has this uh, information. It doesn't take too long. The anaphylaxis, which is the severe reaction, the actual reaction, like somebody gets a bee sting and you know, swells up, is rare and has occurred in approximately two to five people per million. Two to five per, for every million. That's an infinitesimal amount. And severe allergic reactions can occur after any vaccination. But that's why people hang out for 15 minutes after they get the shot, so that people can monitor if you're having a reaction. There was something in the news about uh, the Johnson and Johnson. There was a pause, you know, the blood clots, you know what I'm talking about? The thrombosis with thrombocytopenia syndrome is rare. The confirmed cases, 47 out of 15.3 million. And the only other times were two with the Moderna. So statistically speaking, out of 394 million vaccinations with the Moderna, only two people had that reaction. And again, this is as of, you know, October, late October. There's also um, a report of guillain barre syndrome. It's a neurological problem. Uh, most people fully recover. Some people do have nerve damage. But again, it's very, a very small number, 238 out of 15.3 million. And there was actually an increase in that syndrome after the flu shot in 1976. Then when they did follow-up studies, they determined that the person was more likely to get that syndrome after having the flu versus having the flu vaccine. There's also been mention of heart problems. Uh, again, they've done some studies on that. There have been 963 confirmed cases of myocarditis or, and pericarditis as of October 20, 20th. That's it, confirmed. And they're still investigating whether it's actually a relationship to the vaccine. Because you can have, I mean, I could get the, the COVID shot and then go outside and get hit by a truck. That doesn't mean that the COVID killed me. That means that the truck killed me. So they have to look at the data to see if there's actually a causal relationship. And as I meant, the only causal, plausible causal relationship that they have found is the blood clots with the platelets problem. And again, that was 47 out of 15.3 million. So I just think we need to consider the, the data. Um, we, and another thing that I've noticed, it's, this is across the country, I think we really need to do a lot more in the way of educating people. We have literacy in language. We need scientific literacy as well. And I did my best <laughs> as a science teacher. Sorry, <laughs> I failed. Um, you know, some people have said, you know, the messenger RNA just it was too fast. It was too fast of a rollout. They've been working on messenger RNA vaccinations for 10 years. And because they've been already working on it, they were able to switch gears very quickly and manage this. I mean, think about the technology and the things that we have nowadays, like this. This was unheard of when the older vaccines were being developed. Messenger RNA is a completely different approach. You don't have any sign of the, the virus in the vaccine at all. It's just some, a set of instructions. And as far as the DNA is concerned, there's, there's no relationship to DNA you know, you're not going to grow antlers from getting the vaccine. Another thing that I heard, this came out of New York City. The police were, were asked, why are, why are you so opposed to the vaccine? And some of them actually said, I'm not actually opposed to the vaccine per se. I just don't like people telling me what to do. I mean, these are police officers whose job it is to enforce the rules. And they were complaining that somebody was telling them what to do. So last time when I said, I want to travel again, it's a desire to get back to normal. I just want to get back to normal. Are we going to be wearing masks for the next year or two? It's ridiculous. And the longer people argue about the vaccine, the longer we will take to get back to normal. But we can't afford to have people out on unpaid leave. We simply cannot afford to have, like, for example, a computer teacher out of the classroom. We would not be able to find a replacement. And as much as I would like to say to people, 
get the vaccine. We can't do it right now. So I'm in agreement with the superintendent. I would go along with the July date, just fine. Um, it would also be a nightmare for HR, but the bottom line is we're here for the students. And regardless of what I think about the opinions of the, the staff who won't get the vaccine, we can't afford to be without the staff. And we would be doing our students a disservice if we were not able to provide them the education that they deserve. Finally, um, I would welcome anybody out there to email me with their opinions. I will do my best to respond and do some research like I did over the weekend. Uh, somebody emailed me a doctor's opinion, but the doctor turned out to be a, a holistic and homeopathic doctor. We know how that turned out with the certain football player today. Um, but I will do my due diligence and I will dig and I will research. Just give me their source. So I, I know where you're getting your information because I don't want to do some research only to find out that it came from your cousin on Facebook. You know, give me a like the CDC or the FDA or some something that has some credibility. So anyway, I just wanted to put that out there and I hope I was somewhat PC. I'm just, but I wanted to put the science perspective out there. And again, if you have different data to show me, send it along and I'll take a look. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Nelson. That actually is very factual. Thank you. Uh, any other board questions or comments? Trustee Diaz. Uh, previously, I mentioned how I was surprised to see the action item, but having it be on there, I do think that the brush is a little broad for, for all the different subgroups in there. Uh, we have employees, which are fully uh, W-2 employees, uh, volunteers, parents, is what I consider another group. And then there's people who are subcontracted and paid either directly, indirectly through subcontractors or interns, paid or not paid contractors. And other, and as the uh, item said, also other individuals who do in-person work. And just for completeness, there's a student group also. So that's uh, yet another group that's in there. So in, in my mind, uh, Employees and students are covered by by the state mandate that supposedly is coming. Whether it comes or not, that's that's kind of handled separately, and that kind of also allows the district to not be the uh, the enforcer in that in that realm. Uh, even though, and 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 I kind of mentioned that at the last meeting too. That I was very proud of the employees achieving a ninety some percent uh, vaccination rate, and. Um, and if they were all like in an in-service state, that would make a big difference. But they are on a campus where once, even though even though they they were to achieve 100%, they would still be the minority amongst students at, at that point. So I, I appreciate what they've done and I appreciate their bravery for stepping into the environment that they do on a daily basis to, to, uh, to succeed at, at teaching. So as, as the action item is presented, I don't think I would be able to act on it as it is painting this big broad brush of, of employees, volunteers, interns, contractors, individuals who do in-person work, all that. I, I would rather have it see it broken down into, into separate chunks. And COVID is moving so fast that if January is not a date and July is now a proposed date, then I would propose just wait at that point because everything is changes so much and, and is in flux so much that things can and will change between now and then. It doesn't have to be till June 1st, but it could be February 1st, for example, or January 1st uh, uh, at the turn of the of the year. Well, I'll respond and then um, Dr. Winslow can respond. This po po board policy covers any employee or contracted employee or volunteer that would provide in-person services to students. That, and we have to include all those groups. We can't exclude one of those groups. Eventually, we're going to have parent volunteers back. They will be covered by this policy. We're not going to allow parent volunteers to come on campuses without being vaccinated, uh, just like we're not going to allow you know, other employees to come on campus. 
we have to have the contracted employees. As you know, we have lots of contracted employees, especially in special education. So those, of course, have to be covered by this policy. And I'm sure Dr. Winslow wants to add a word or two about that. Yeah, there's actually two main reasons why it really needs to be as broad as it's presented. Number one, all of those categories are subject to all current medical laws when working with children, for example, tuberculosis. So that law is very clear where volunteers, contractors, employees, it does not impact students, right? There's no, that's a completely separate law uh, when it comes to student mandate for, for TB screen. And so when you look at the actual ed code and the laws in regards to medical um, clearance for anybody to engage within public school, uh, that's why it has to be that broad. Uh, number two, this is actually these, all of these categories are in the current order from the state of California. So every one of these categories are called out by the state for the current vaccinate or test legislation or order that we're currently subject to. And as far as we know, according to Sacramento's announcement, that will turn into a vaccine mandate for all of these categories as well. And so in number three, all of the research that we've done, there's no board policy that we've seen that doesn't include all of these together. And so that's those are the three reasons why the district is presenting it, again, in consult with general counsel in this forum. Well, like, for example, right now, volunteers and parents just aren't allowed, right? But we want them to come back on our campuses, so we definitely want to include them in this policy. Oh, and, and I agree. I, I think I think they can be covered in a policy. I don't know. I mean, if we're already pushing, if GUSD is already pushing it out till June, I feel like they're already kind of separating out and saying we don't want to do anything in the meantime between now and then because we would be affecting those employees, especially that part where it's hard to get uh, employees, it's hard to get uh, substitutes. You know, all that kind of stuff. Well, so the current, the current order from the state requires everyone to, it's vaccinated or tested. So you, everyone has to meet that requirement between now and July. So anyone who's working with students in our district yep. has to be vaccinated or tested weekly. Okay. So one thing, so the superintendent and Mr. Winslow have addressed why it needs to be these classes of people because the whole point of this is to protect students. And if we don't include everybody that has contact with students, what's the point? The second th point I want to respond to is when you when you started, you started ident identifying all these groups. And you said it included the student groups. That's a misrepresentation of what this policy is. It doesn't cover students. And I don't know where this idea that the district is imposing any requirements on students is because it's not there. Sure. So making statements like that isn't helpful. Well, I might have been misinterpreted. I'm just saying that that was a group that wasn't wasn't mentioned. Well, that, yeah, that, exactly. Yeah. It's not. Oh, well, I, I understand. I, I, I'm not saying to include them. I'm just saying that they're a whole other group that isn't in here. That that's that I'm not. I'm I'm definitely not proposing to add them. Okay. I'm just kind of for completeness saying that is another group that's there that at some point will be covered either by California mandates or federal mandates right. or that kind of okay. thing. Okay, Mr. Barnston and then Trustee Fiat. Um, I'd like to start with agreeing with uh, Michelle on her point of making sure that the, the mandate goes out on July 1st rather than January 1st, because currently because of the teacher and sub shortages, missing out on any teachers for up to th uh, three weeks if we're requiring both uh, doses of the vaccine um, would be three weeks of at least take over high school students in the theater or students with um, other teachers that don't know uh, the subjects that they're teaching, which can lead to confusion among the students and staff as to what's going on um, and where. And I know that at least for um, a lot of my teachers, I have yet to have them outside of class, like absent for long periods of time, three weeks would leave especially for AP classes, right? Where it'll leave you with three weeks of work that you'd have to catch up on. Um, and that would leave a lot of students struggling, especially on AP exams or um, just their schooling in general. Thank you. Trustee Fiak? 
Um, so I wish we weren't here, right? I wish that um, that we didn't have to have this uh, this mandate. I wish that all of our staff have on their own chosen to vaccinate for the protection of not only the kids that they work with, but the community as well. Um, I personally had COVID. Um, I was hospitalized several times. Uh, it's not fun. Um, and it, I, my husband actually brought it home because he caught it at work and then spread it with our family. And there's a lot of his coworkers who did the same thing, brought it home. And some of their parents are not with us today because of that. So, I mean, this is really uh, a non-issue for me. I think everyone should be vaccinated. <laughs> Um, and I wish that we could do it by January 1st. I totally understand that um, to give teachers notice um, because of the teacher shortage um, to, to, to push it back to July 1st. I would like to recommend, I, I believe um, uh, it was a suggestion that we have a tiered approach where any new staff, any new con uh, contractors that um, that is a mandate for them. For any existing staff, contractors that we have now, not just so that we don't disrupt the service, um, that they have the Ju July 1st or June whatever deadline. But I definitely, um, as it is now, I wanna add that tiered approach. Thank you, Trustee Aguirre. Thank you. Um, I would have never thought a year ago when I was elected to this, um, that we would be sitting here talking about <laughs> vaccine mandates. That's not not anything I, I thought would be um, an agenda item. Um, and I'm, I just wanna reiterate my feelings from the previous board meeting. I believe in the science, I believe in the vaccinations um, for, for adults at this point. Um, I wish it was a non-issue. I wish that we would all do it. Um, I worry about some of the ramifications of this. Uh, we already have not enough staff across the board. And I really worry about what this could do. And I'm here for the students. So it's, it's hard to, you know, I wanna protect them and keep them safe. We also need staff and teachers. Um, so it's tough. And I feel like, I mean, from, from the get go, I feel like it necessarily shouldn't come from the board, it should come from the state. And I, I would like for it, us to pause and wait for that action. Um, I also had a thought, and I don't know if this is a good time to, um, I'll just say, it. Is, is there a way that maybe we can incentivize this to get like maybe a few more? <laughs> like, congratulations, thank you for getting the vaccination. We appreciate you. Here's I don't know, just a thought, I just wanna put that out there. Um, my other thought that I had, we know that masks are working. So at least we have that to, um, to hold on to. We know that it's not spreading on school sites. We know that we can, the masks and the hand washing and the sanitizing is, is helping this situation. Um, so I'm okay with waiting. Um, I'd like to cross my fingers and hope some more friends of ours get um, get the notion and move forward with us. Yes. Um, anyways, thank you. Thank you. Any other board questions or comments? Trustee Paceno. As much as I would like to wait for Sacramento, Sacramento doesn't have a really good track record with me or with us or with schools in general. And um, being a former HR person, I, I sympathize with uh, Dr. Winslow mm -hmm. and knowing what's happening, we will be in um, hiring mode come February and March. And if we don't put it out there that we expect that you're going to be vaccinated, then that's gonna be a nightmare. So we can't wait and say, well, let's wait for Sacramento in July because we will have hired 
a whole bunch of people that may not be vaccinated, and then we're in the same boat again. Um, I understand the um, pragmatic approach of waiting till July 1. I would like it to be the Monday after the last day of school, or at least that week. I think <laughs> as much time as we can buy will um, hold us in good stead. So if we're looking at the 13th or of June or the June 20th, uh, which is the second week, the, that week, I, I, I don't know. I worry that July 1 might be too late. And the sooner we can get that, at least get one vaccine, you know, the expectation is you will have at least one shot by June 20th. There's no reason for that not to happen. Um, and that any new employee will be vaccinated. You know, I could, and, and I know this is an action item, but maybe we look at the wording and reword it with some care and bring it back to the next meeting. Um, Cause I wanna make sure we're, we're stepping out in front of Sacramento which doesn't bother me because Sacramento off, obviously and oftentimes steps back and hides. And even though they have said that uh, there will be a mandate, we all know that that's probably going to change in some fashion. <laughs> and that mandate may never come to be. Um, The whole idea of the student mandate that we are going to mandate student vaccinations is ludicrous. We don't mandate that. Sacramento does, if they do. It, I just got an email right now as I'm sitting here from somebody in my area saying they're really concerned about the action we're going to take tonight about student vaccinations. So I will be emailing the back saying we're not doing that. Um, it bothers me about the misinformation that, that goes on and quickly goes on. Thank you, social media. Um, but I, I firmly believe that we need to control what we can control in keeping our kids and our staff safe and our community. And I do believe in the science and these vaccinations. When we're talking about... Um, one of the callers said something about 14,000 cases of, I, I wrote it down somewhere, I can't remember. When you're talking about millions of doses, that's probably less than 1%, you know? So you're looking at infinitesimal, and the numbers sound good, but in when you look at the whole picture, not so much. Um, so anyway, bottom line is yes, I would like to see a board policy. I would like to see it uh, put into effect for new hires immediately, new hires for um, current and even for next year, and um, for continuing employees. Um, the expect my expectation would be that they get at least one shot by June twentieth. Can I ask for a clarification? The last day of school is June tenth. June tenth. So. That gives them a week oh, okay. and a half. That gives them 10 days to get one shot. After the last day of school. After the last day of school. Okay. The student wants to speak, Mark. Go ahead, Mr. Ruth. Um, I would definitely say that if we include having the clinic, like towards the end of school or after school is over, and start with that as a way to introduce the mandate into the teachers, that would probably be the easiest and fastest way to get it to them rather than them making their own appointment that could be somewhere like San Jose or like another city that won't have any, you know, um, centers for vaccination. We just provided a clinic this week for all staff and we'll probably do it a couple of times before June that because they felt that it went really well. They thought 137 was a lot. I wanted to see more. <laughs> but they thought that was really good. So anyway, we, we have a great relationship with public health departments, starting with the clinic that was at Gilroy High. And by the way, earlier we flashed a bunch of uh, site-based clinics that are coming up. So we've had a lot of clinics, but for staff, we just tried our own and it worked. So we'll do it again. 
Any other board questions or comments? Trustee Diaz? Uh, just piggybacking off of Ms. Piceno and Dr. Flores as well is, uh, yeah, it'd be good to know like what date you're targeting, like July 1st for what particular reason, because we can rally behind that as well. And, um, and and I did get some numbers that California has had, our population is 39 million, uh, has had 55 million doses administered. Uh, so administered, they're not unique. 25 million are fully vaccinated. Uh, and in the U.S. it's 222 million. So the numbers really point out that how small those those small cases are. Um, and I do want to reiterate thanks for opening those vaccine clinics. I was part of that and I, I received my third one and I've had four total vaccines this year, including a flu vaccine. And we really, really rallied behind it. I really appreciate that that the district has made that possible. And, uh, and I ran into a couple other trustees there and we were really, it was interesting how cautious we were to work around that initial rush, work around that 3 p.m. rush when when, yeah. when staff would get out. We kind of were really diligent about coming in 2.30-ish, 2.45. Uh, but the staff was, the location was great. The parking was great. And the attending staff was was great as well. And I, uh, I can't thank you guys enough for that. Christine Nelson? I still miss my lollipop. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, Trustee Vasuno mentioned a few tweaks. I do have some suggestions on, on tweaks if we approve this. Uh, what I would recommend doing is the second full paragraph where it defines who has to get it. And we talk about district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform work for the district. And then later in the document, we just refer to employee. So I would uh, recommend at immediately at the end of that paragraph where it says district, uh, adding an open parentheses here and after quote, quotation mark, employee, quotation mark, and then close parentheses. So that way when we say employees, yeah. we know who we're talking about. Mm -hmm. second, second recommendation I would make on page two, uh, where it starts off subject to the district's express authorization. And then it, it ends with uh, January 1st, 2022. Then we change that to July 1st, 2022. And then we add a second sentence or an additional sentence at the end of that that says new employees must, new employees hired after November 4th, 2021 must provide this information to the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources by January 1st, 2022. So we're doing what we can and we're not impacting uh, negatively impacting student learning. I mean, if 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 it were possible to replace everybody who said who held their breath and said I refuse by January first, I would go for January first. But it's not possible. Um, so that would be my preference. But I have to acknowledge the reality, and so that's why I'm going along with the district recommendation of uh, J uh, July first. And then do we want to add a sentence requiring a first dose? We could do that too. How do, how do June volunteers 20th? and parents come into play? Pardon me? How do volunteers and, and parents come into play? And well, they're defined. I don't know, I don't know what you're talking about. If there's parents aren't listed here. In, in district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district. So parent doesn't fall in that definition unless they're also in one of those categories. Would they fall under volunteer? Could, if they volunteer, if they volunteer. Sure. So what, like, um, say, so this applies till July 1st, like in, in case they want to help out March, in case the district opens up possibilities for parents to help out, would they be able to earlier? If we approve this policy uh, and we allowed people, anybody to come in, yeah, because it wouldn't apply. But they would, they would have to be vaccinated. Would they be yeah. new employees? They would would they be new employees yeah. after January yeah. 1? And have to and have to be yeah. vaccinated by January one. I maintain. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. yeah, that is true. Yeah. 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 Now we have a in here. I'm looking for it. I'm sorry. Where's the 30 day reference? It's on the the third paragraph, the first paragraph under the requirement to obtain COVID-19. So the way it's written, it does I think express what you are looking for as a board. It says as of the effective date of this policy, the district will require 
all employees to begin obtaining a COVID-19 vaccine. So we would define obtaining as beginning the series of a two dose or getting the single dose. And I believe that's kind of the idea that at least get on the road to receiving the vaccine. Um, so I believe that would cover it. The, the one unique Is thing that- Putting a period after vaccine? Uh, uh, Dr. Winslow, I'm sorry, I was looking for it. So are you it, suggesting putting a period after vaccine and deleting that within 30 calendar days of the board's action? Well, I, the comment that I heard was to at least get a single dose, yeah. some type of qualification to begin the process. I think this does does explain that. Um, another way to maybe think about some of the comments that I'm hearing is this this policy could potentially go into effect as is, but within this paragraph, it does say reasonable requests may be made to extend the timeline it must be approved by the assistant superintendent of HR. Um, the board could direct the district that any existing employee or contractor be given that extended timeline. So essentially the policy could exist as is and as written with the direction that any existing employee would be granted an extension to July 1 of 2022. A lot of the references in section one that's about the verification of vaccines. So we wouldn't want to touch those dates. That's actually already law, um, but we do have to establish it within the policy to say that we've received it. And so Dr. Flores's proposed letter actually states that you have already done this, but if for some reason you haven't, you need to get us verification of vaccine status. Um, so those are some of the ideas on timelines. Another complication with the difference between employee and that large subgroup at the beginning is we wouldn't engage in the interactive process with non-employees. So when you see references to employees, those are really about our collecting documentation because we do that for our employees and not other contractors. And we also only engage in the interactive process for exemptions with our employees because that's a Title VII right so for example, if we subcontracted with Row Health, for example, they're subject to the board policy, but they're not subject to the interactive process because they don't work for us. So there is that difference between the whole subgroup that is required to vaccinate and exemptions, and the other part of the policy is exclusive to employees because that's under Title VII. So that's a more structural change than just redefining employee. So maybe that wordsmithing would be hard to do right up here right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we wouldn't. So we wouldn't define them as employees in the second paragraph. Yeah. But we would need a defined term for a lot of them somehow, because I'm sure there are some references. Yeah. Yeah. As we reviewed the policy, that was one of the, again the complications, and even some of the existing policies and other boards. Um, they, they've also kind of fallen into that trap where it's, it's this idea that you, know, you have to separate the two. You have a vaccine mandate for anybody that works with a child, and then you have the exemption process, which is exclusive. It's an exclusive process between the employer and the employee. And so that's why the, the policy attempted to divide the two to state that the board's requiring this, but there are exemptions for employees um, under Title VII. And so that's why you see the preamble and the part of the requirement um, that really focuses on this impacts everybody. And then all of the existing sub-language refers to employees with the interactive process, non-compliance, separation from service, and all that type of terminology. Well, we, we would still need to change the date on the second page yeah. yep. and, and add a requirement that uh, proof be provided for all new employees after November 4th. Yeah. And right? that entire group is included in Roman numeral one, verification of receipt of vaccine. It's just starting in Roman numeral two. The request for comment. The, accommodations the and request exemptions. for exemptions. That's where every, that's where employees start. But that first section is everybody. 
that we could change. Is all. that is it correct? Yeah, the, that correct? yeah. The idea is that the the intent of the board would be to guarantee that all adults working with children were vaccinated. Right. Um, and so that's that's kind of a non-negotiable policy, and there's only exemptions to that policy if you work for the school district. Right. So in that last paragraph, right before request for exemptions, for example, it says subject to district's express authorization, employees must utilize one of these. Well, correct. everybody has to utilize one of those. All employees, correct. So we would not no, do that for no, even, even interns contractors. and contractors and everybody else must utilize one of these methods. Well, we, we, we could not engage in the interactive process with a contractor. Right, no, but that's not the, that's not what that first section is talking about. We need a new defined global term that's everyone, everyone that it applies to the first page in Roman numeral one, and then Roman numeral two is for employees, right? right. I think we need time to wordsmith this so that it's okay. really, really clear. Yeah. And then I'm assuming, for instance, any uh, contractors that we sign um, MOUs or whatever with, you know, they do the they they self uh, certify for the TV fingerprint, right. and then they'll have to do one for COVID. Correct. Right. Yeah. The the existing template we have refers to the current law, which is vaccinate or test, and we push the obligation to collect vaccine information and to test and all of that on the contractor. Um, we would then have to modify, should this policy come into form, we would modify an Appendix C or something like that. That would be self-certification of vaccination. Um, so so I'm, I'm still a little confused about why we can't move ahead with this policy, change the date, and require new employees, unless you're saying that this policy was ineffective as written. No, no, I'm not. What, what, what I was referring to was looking at timelines um, because we have, instead of putting like a July 1 timeline and a January 1 timeline and separating within the policy new and existing employees, the way it's written, it states it's a policy. It comes into effect on X date, but the district has the authority to extend the actual deadline to begin the dosage. And so in the policy, you wouldn't have to differentiate as it's written new employees versus existing employees because it gives that that discretion so uh, so if we give you direction then we don't need to change anything is that what you're saying that, that would be my opinion and you can give the you could give hr and staff the direction that you are seeking that the district provide time extensions for this policy so what we would do operationally is notify existing staff that a new policy is in effect. It goes into effect January 1, but we are granting extensions to July 1 or whichever date the board provides direction to meet that actual mandate. Uh, and so for what that would do- For existing staff only. Correct, yeah, if, if that's the direction. And that's that third paragraph that states that um, reasonable request may be made to extend the timeline and must be approved by the assistant superintendent of HR. I, so just, I'm just I'm just wondering why you wouldn't want to say it expressly. Why does it need to be not in there? It's not that I don't want to. It's just it's another way to look at it. Should you not want to touch a lot of the language? I, but absolutely, you can. That's why I wrote it down and read it into the record, so it would be easy and easily understandable. Sure. It would seem to me that that would be. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but that would be an undue um, burden to HR to write it as, well, anytime between now and July 1 and come on down and it's really January 1, but we're going to extend it for you until July 1. That's going to be confusing. I, it concerns me that it'll be confusing and HR will have to deal with that. As for, yeah, I mean, for me personally, I don't, this is just me, I don't think it would be a burden to extend that because then that would give us six months to engage in 130 interactive processes or processes should that happen. Um, the worry about doing a January one for all existing employees mm -hmm. is we would have to do 131 interactive meetings right. within a five week period. And so the extension of the six months wouldn't do an additional burden on us uh, in terms of the operations of it. 
but well, again, you're saying just changing. I agree with Mark. Just change the date to July one or whatever. Sure. No, absolutely. Instead of saying it's January one, but we're really going to extend it because if they read it and see January one, I'd freak. Okay. If I were one of the 130 who yep. didn't get vaccinated. But then we would have to add additional language. Is I think for new, for new, new hires. hires. So that's I think. So um, then we wouldn't have to add anything for new employees. Exactly. Exactly. If we had it at, like this as is, we wouldn't have to add any new language. Or Yeah, or the fact that it is like this as is right now, yeah. you, we can approve it as is as opposed to going one more cycle. Is there wording uh, in case something from up above changes or, or gives different direction? So if, if it's yeah. the county or the state or the federal? Any laws or anything more restrictive, we would be bound to. Okay. So if they came out with something more restrictive, then we by default would be bound to that. Yeah, well, state, just like we change all our BPs all the time, yeah. as we're doing on this <laughs> later. Well, well that's, a, that's a very real possibility. I mean, yeah. like you may think that they might not rely on them, but they may come along and all this is a moot point. Well, uh, and, and I hope it, and I hope it is. Yep. You know, we, we, I agree. we're superseded by the county yep. or the state or the feds. I agree with Trustee Aguirre. Yep. It's ridiculous that we'd be looking at this. But frankly, I don't I like Trustee Piceno. I don't trust the state. The state does not care about education. I said this at the last meeting. If they did, they would fund it. They just talk about it when they're running for election and they forget about it. And they don't, to that level, apparently they don't care about students. It certainly is not as much as we do. So the buck stops here. That's why I'm strongly in favor of it. So, Trustee Nelson. Michelle. So, going back to about 10, 15 minutes ago. Um, <laughs> so on, on the back, let's say section one, verification of receipt of COVID-19 vaccine. Can we just replace the January 1st, 2022 with July 1st, 2022? And then add one sentence about new employees hired after November 4 must provide proof of vaccination to the assistant soup of HR by whatever, or just must provide proof of vaccination. And then I still have a question about the first page as of the effective date of this policy, the district will require all employees to begin obtaining a COVID-19 vaccine within 30 calendar days. Yeah. That makes, that makes, that makes no sense. Yes. Um, I agree. And then the reasonable request, just that, you know, yeah, whatever reasonable request. Yeah. But as of the, that makes no sense. Can we just strike it? Cause, or just put the date in there. I agree, Michelle. Okay. That too. sentence confuses me. Strike it. Yeah. I, I, I would, what I would do is, as of the effective day of this policy, the district will require all employees to be getting, obtaining a COVID-19 vaccine, and I would just put a period and strike the remainder. Period. Yes. Fine. That's what I suggest. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. vaccine okay. period. 15 start. minutes ago, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, it takes a while. It's a process. It, it took yeah. us a while to come around. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it feels like we've resolved some of the issues, but the definition of employee are we we all cool on that we we're gonna not we're not gonna include that so we're striking the the definition that you had the yes. defined term yeah so then are we comfortable with how it's the word employee is used throughout then yes based on uh, the so like the, the paragraph f employees may, may obtain any of the covid 9 vaccines covid 19 vaccines the word employee is there now doesn't have a meaning that's consistent with our goal. So we need a, an everyone kind of term. Yeah, so I, I, I hear exactly what you're saying. So perhaps there, re-enumerate every category to clarify it. Uh, this Michelle again. So on the first page, so where it says this policy applies to all full and part-time district employees, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Can we just add a sentence? Non-district employees will not, you know, something about, <clears throat> they don't have the exemption, something about non-district employees, except for, you know, the exemption. This policy, this policy applies to all full and part-time district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district. Non-district employees may not use an exemption or accommodation. That's going to depend on their 
their employee, the contractor and the employee. Well, it is, but, but we're not in charge. So something in there about we're separate. We can we just separate the two groups there? It might be challenging. I don't think that we need to since it is separated um, between one and two. Right. Based on Trustee Pace's comments, I would recommend in the paragraph that starts employees may obtain to actually enumerate all full-time and part-time district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district may obtain any of the and continue. Okay, then the next sentence, we have the word employees again. Yes. That needs to be rehandled. Yeah, there's like and then the next six sentence, employees. And then the next sentence. That's why I was trying to address it with We're right, but that, yeah. right, but that created other problems. Right. So we need a new defined term for in our, full set. Are there enough then, changes? Are there enough changes no. where where it needs to be wordsmith and come back to us? And I mean, we're getting close. I think. Yeah, I think so. I I think there's enough direction for that. Because we don't need to do that through the whole document. We just need to do that through the well, beginning. So where it says I hope employees, so, but I, you know, because okay. the rest of the document applies to employees. Okay. So we need to do that through the first section, right, Paul? Yeah, first, I, I think maybe then, yeah, right. maybe then going back to Trustee Good's comments about in that second paragraph, maybe making some type of broad statement like affected parties or something like that, then changing that word in the first page. And then when you get to the part of, of actual yes. exemptions, then you're using the word employees. Right, yes. right. Because two yes. on is employees. Right. Yeah. So, the preamble and section one will have a new word for instead of employees. A new term, affected new term. parties or something like that. Okay. Um, however, we could talk to legal on what's a good word for that. And yeah. then um, then the subsequent language about the accommodations and separation from service and all that would be exclusive the word employees. Okay. What is, what is the, the encompassing term that we're trying to accomplish with employees by redefining employees or? No, we're not redefining employees. Okay. And now we're redefining yeah. all full and part-time district employees, interns, volunteers, contractors, and all other individuals who perform in-person work for the district. Yeah. So anybody who gets yeah, So parentheses, kind of affected, quotation, affected, affected individuals or something affected. to that effect. Yeah, that would, that, yeah, thank me, you. that would do it. I think that would do it. That. Yeah. Can you can you restate that again? What, what what wording are you thinking of? So at the end of that paragraph, this policy applies to yep. put a new defined term, which we said was affected people. <laughs> something yeah, affected individuals affected or affected individuals. parties or something to affected that effect. Parties. Parties. Affected parties. And then that term affected parties would be interjected, replacing oh, the word employees on the first page and section one. Right. Okay. Yeah. I'm so fine with so that. in any place where this policy is applicable to everybody, we would use the new term that's defined in the first page, and then any part that's exclusive to employees, like Title VII interactive process, we would use the term employees. And that starts where it says request for exemption. Right. And it would be to cover the second district page. employees. Yes. It would be yeah. to cover. Because yeah. employee, if district is being used as an adjective for employees, and yeah, and it can just be hyphenated because you're using it to or strike the word district. Uh, but if you if you really mean just district employees or or people who are employed, I think we're rewriting it so that the word employee, regardless where in the document, means people who work for the district. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And I I'm sorry. I still want a finished copy for us to look at before we approve it. Okay. I don't know if anybody else feels that way, but. I don't know. I think I since like... we're postponing it, it doesn't really, yeah, it's yeah. fine. But yeah, that, two weeks isn't gonna make any difference. I don't think. How about if we approve it and have a first reading? This is our first reading. And then we'll just confirm it. And that's the only thing. At the next consent, time. Consent make, it next time. To make sure it reflects what we said. I like that. All right, so I would entertain a motion. What is the motion is to accept this with the proposed amendments? If the, you know, with the proposed amendments, uh, uh, adding the term affected parties, changing that in the document, striking the language in the fourth paragraph, it says striking within 30 calendar days of the board's action, 
And then on page two, changing the date to July 1st, 2022, and adding the sentence stating new employees hired after November 4th must provide this information to the Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources by January 1st, 2022. So that would be the changes. Linda, do you want to make a case for something besides July 1st? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I, I would like to see um, June twenty. June twentieth. That's Monday, June twentieth. I mean that. I think gives people plenty of time. I can live with that. I can live with that. Oh, oh hang on just a second. So they're supposed to have proof of full vaccination. So there's a two uh, two week window. Yes. First shot. So, Four but weeks. I don't think that that's what this says. Uh, you're right. Full vaccination. All applicable doses. Okay, July 1 then, because that gives them enough <laughs> yeah. time to have both. Yeah. Well, if you're going to do that, then and are, are boosters included in here and yeah. whatever yeah. other boosters may be? Yeah. Those yeah. are applicable boosts. Uh, vaccination fully vaccinated is two. two or one. Two or one and J, J and J. I'm, I'm okay with, uh, with one. Uh, I think Paul alluded to that uh, with due diligence uh, starting by July 1st. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, giving teachers that final little push and able to finish off the school year and time to mull it over if they have to or get information. They got plenty. They've had a year and a half yeah. to mull it over. I say done by July one. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is that your motion? Uh, but at that point, you're also Malkin, but. Um, so what is the motion at this point? The, the <laughs> amendments as stated. <laughs> the amendments as stated with. Yeah, no, I just, I just, I just restated them all. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, you just stated them all. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's your motion. Is there a second? Second. Vicky, is that your motion? Because uh, you started it. It seems like the motion is to come back in two weeks, though, isn't it? Or, or is it the amending of this document? I see. Uh, I didn't make a motion. Okay, okay. so I will, I will move to um, adopt this document with the amendments that we have discussed. Is there a second? And I'll second that. Okay. All what those in what Mark said. <laughs> All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, D Trustee Diaz, any other opposition? Okay, six to one. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item. C, increase of service agreement with Adriana San Millen School Psychology and Special Education Services, LLC, for the 2021-22 school year. Um, good evening, Trustee um, and Dr. Flores. I'm here to bring to you forth uh, an increase in the contract to Andrea San Milan. Um, we are using one-time funds that were apportioned to special education local planning areas um, learning to provide learning recovery support. Um, and it was based on the, the um, based on pupils with exceptional needs as reported in the fall census of 19, of 2019, 20 and 2021 school years. And the purpose of these funds is to help provide learning recovery support to pupils. Um, and through um, the shutdowns, we are still trying to um, update and make sure all our assessments are correct and um, in compliance. And besides compliance, assessment lets us know where our students are functioning. So we were able to um, provide services and um, have solid defensible IEPs that are able to provide the support to our students that we need. So um, this is very important to us. Um, we. Um, had discussed um, options um, in SELPA, all the different districts did. We had to provide a plan to our SELPA for approval, and then they they um, presented it to the state as how we were going to use this, and it was approved by SELPA. So I'm bringing forth um, this contract to you to be able to um, implement this. Are there any board questions or comments? Seeing none, this is an action item. I move for approval. Ms. Michelle, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Motion carries, thank you. Next, item number D, increase of service agreement with Ed Theory for the 2021 to 2022 school year. 
Okay, so um, good evening again. So my second item, I was here a couple weeks ago with the initial contract for Ed Theory. Um, at that time, um, we were fully staffed, but lots have changed in the last couple weeks. So we've had to open an additional classroom. And you might see me here again because we've actually had a, a, a teacher resign in a special education program. So we're going to be trying to fill that vacancy. So this contract is increased to provide um, a teacher um, to uh, cover the classroom that we had to um, open at one of our high schools. Any board questions or comments? Trustee Diaz? Do you foresee any difficulties in trying to fill that position? Nope, we already have it taken care of. <laughs> so in, in that case, should it come in as an increase or wouldn't it just be transfer over filling in a position that already existed? So we actually, and with Mr. Winslow, it is an additional FTE that we were unable to fill, um, you know, through direct, um, uh, you know, direct hire. So we were able to um, secure it through the um, contracting agency. Any other questions or comments? If not, this is an action item. This is Michelle, I'll move approval. This is a second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Motion Thank carries. You. Item E, board policy revision, second reading. Thank you, Mr. Good. At the last board meeting, I presented to you uh, the September 2021 board policy revisions that we received from the California School Board Association service that we use and asked that if you had any questions about those, you would forward those to me. I received none. So I'm requesting your approval of the most recent board policy revisions. Move for approval. Second. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Next, we have board member reports. Board member reports. Seeing none. Upcoming and new referral agenda items. Does anybody have any upcoming new and referral agenda items? Oh, this is Michelle. I, I don't, but I was wondering when will that contract amendment come back? It was pulled last time. It was um, item 8D. It was uh, Earth Systems for Geotechnical Observation, Inspection, and Testing Services for Phase 1, Increment 2 for South Valley. I assume it'll come to the next board Excellent. meeting because we do facilities items at the second board meeting of the month. Alvaro is shaking his head, so. Okay, thanks. All right, announcements. The next regular meeting of the Board of Education will be held on Thursday, November 18th, 2021. Closed session will begin at 5.30 p.m. followed by the regular meeting at 7 p.m. The agenda will be available on the district's website by 5 p.m. on Friday, November 12th. It's after nine now. A little after nine. It's just a little, let me, before I adjourn the meeting, let me ask this. Would you like to adjourn, adjourn to closed session to finish up? Yeah. How many? Uh, okay, well, then in that case, this, uh, we will adjourn 